Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Florian Pistoni. Florian is the CEO of InOrbit, a company that makes robot operations software. Florian, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me, Spencer. It's great to be here in Pittsburgh. Good to have you in from the Bay Area, buddy. Yeah. All right. So tell me a little bit about what you're up to at InOrbit and kind of how you went down this road. Yeah. So we work on something we call RoboOps. So if you've heard of DevOps, we do robot operations or robots. So DevOps is something that basically makes the cloud work. So when you look at companies that have a high scale, you know, they support a billion users, um, you know, there's this whole infrastructure behind it. And, um, you know, the principles that were developed over 20 years ago um, basically change how software goes from the developer to actual operations. So back in the battle days, you would write some code, and when you're done, you toss it over the wall, and it's somebody else's problem to run the software. Yeah. And the problem with that is when there's when something breaks, there's a lot of finger pointing, and nobody can know how to fix things. So uh, again, with the emergence of the cloud, um, this kind of best practices and tools emerged around this idea of DevOps. So developer practices and operations practice being uh, working together. Yeah. So my background is in the cloud. Um, my co-founder's background is in robotics. And as we started getting into the space, we saw a gap. And the gap was not just in, in tooling and software, but also in the best practices. So. Um, this idea of robot operations it, or robots, as I, as I call it, is how do you bring the roboticists that are making robots, the people who are running the robots, closer together on the same wavelength, if you will. Yeah. Um, and then we built the tool that allows you to do that. That's awesome. So I'm going to kind of admit my own shortcoming here, which is I still don't fully understand what my friends in DevOps do entirely. So. I'm admittedly a bit of a layperson to software. I, I got a computer science degree like over a decade ago and then some, and I proceeded to never code with it. And you know, a lot of my engineering background anymore is mechanical and electrical. And so I, I have a basic rudimentary knowledge, but because I live in the R&D space, you know, we don't do as much with DevOps, but I'm excited to kind of hear about that because I don't think any of this stuff would work. like. I mean, Google Drive, YouTube, none of that crap would work without DevOps. Um, anything at scale, I think you need that for. So in theory, I can see the importance of applying that to robots. In practice, it's a little detached from what I do. So this is probably good because this means you've got an idiot here that you can explain this to, and then the audience will understand it. <laughs> so. so I almost feel like I'm your evil twin because I went the other route. So. I did my master's in double E. Nice. And then promptly went to software and never soldered anything. So, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think we can learn from each other. Um, Absolutely. So maybe one way to think about it is another term that's being used in the industry is there's a role that people have called SRE, Site Reliability Engineer. Yeah. So that's something that Google kind of introduced as a practice. The idea is there used to be, back in the day, something called a sysadmin, a system administrator. And they had no idea how to write software, typically. They could turn knobs. Uh, With SREs, the idea was you're a programmer and you're writing code to keep systems running. Oh, interesting. So that's, that's a very important concept, which is you start changing things that used to be you know, settings on a screen into code. That's And now you can write scripts, you can write 
programs that check on the scripts and meta scripts, if you will. Meta scripts, um, and then I don't know if that's a real thing, I just made that up. But. Uh, you just, I think you should patent it or copyright <laughs> it. I'm sure uh, somebody is using the word meta script to describe something already. Probably somebody at Meta is using that, yeah, right? Probably. Um, so anyway, so speaking of Meta, like for example, um, I used to work there um, back when it was called Facebook. Um, so they have their own data centers. And a data center may have a hundred thousand hosts. Each one is like a computer. Um, so when I got into robotics, I came with all that baggage, if you will. And I look at a collection of robots, a fleet of robots, as a kind of a data center from hell. <laughs> right? Because when you think about a data center, you focus on things like you know reliable networking. You focus on reliable power. Yep. You try to have as few moving parts as possible. Yeah, makes sense. And you expect that in a data center with 100,000 things, there's going to be thousands of things that are failing. Yeah. So you expect failure. Statistically, that's that's interesting. Right? And you anticipate failure and you have backups and, you know, um, and, you know, you have recovery mechanisms. Uh, so all these things that, you know, give you reliability. So that's the site reliability aspect. Part of it is how can you anticipate failure versus hope that it doesn't happen? Yeah. So when you try to bring that to robotics, none of that is common practice, right? So first of all, my you know data center from hell analogy is you have all these robots, they're, you know, especially with mobile robots, they're running on battery power. They're moving around, there's people bumping into them. So it's a very chaotic environment. They're usually on you know, a crappy network that wasn't designed for the robots. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And even the best of robots today, state of the art, isn't, you know, five nines perfect. Yeah. It's not even two nines most of the time. It may not even be one nine, right? You're talking about the number of decimals after ninety nine point Yeah. So yeah. so in a you know, when you think about reliability, right, you think about five nines is the, the optimal, right? Yeah. So 99.999% oh, of got the it. time okay. is upside. Sense. So it's, the nines before the decimal count too. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that even the best of mobile robots, which is what we, uh, we end up spending a lot of time on, yeah. are at that level, right? So yeah, um, I agree. So we said, okay, so can we build the resilience into the system versus just make the perfect robot? Yeah, that's an admirable goal and, and one worth pursuing. Yeah. So I guess in my mind, because my perspective is hardware at this point, I'm starting to think about things like having a backup robot around that you could switch over to when sure. the main robot fails. Or, I mean, from some of the projects that we've done, something that comes to mind is onboard prognostics on your hardware. So having, you know, current sensors and acoustic mm -hmm. sensors and temperature sensors on your gearboxes and then establishing a baseline for your nominal operating range on your hardware subsystems. And then when you start to go outside that baseline by a set percentage of nominal, then setting a the flag like, hey, you replace that gearbox because it's going to break. <laughs> and so... That kind of stuff comes up to me. I I worked as an intern in SpaceX's data center mm -hmm. like a decade ago too. So that when you brought up the data center stuff, I right. was thinking about a teeny data center we had. We didn't have a hundred thousand machines in there. Yours at Meta or at Facebook were way bigger. But um, yeah, that's that's where my brain goes. So I guess so. Maybe why am I limited in my view here? So obviously you're thinking about it from a hardware perspective and that's, you know, maybe a, a catastrophic failure, right? Thing goes up in flames. Yeah. You, you need to bring a new one. Yeah, and, and but probably I have a flame suppression system somewhere too. That would be a good idea. Uh, Although maybe not on the robot, right? Maybe well, it depends. it's fixed. On your operating environment, if it's outdoors or if, you know, you've got a ton of square footage to cover, you might have to put it on the robot. It, it depends. I don't know. 
I think you should, you should have a sign that says, you know, tangent alert, and then bring it up when we're about to go on a tangent like that. Um, There's a lot of them on this podcast, Florian. I, I apologize. I, I, uh, I enjoy tangents as much I, as the next one. Um, I like the idea of the sign, though. <laughs> so um, I think there are a lot of less catastrophic failures that happen mu much more often. So, so give me some examples. Uh, a mobile robot gets mislocalized. Got happens it. to the best of robots. Yep. You could have, you know, most robots use sensor fusion. So they have different sensors. Some are LIDARs, cameras, odometry. Sometimes um, those things get out of whack. And it could be as simple as it bump into something. And all of a sudden, the odometry and the point cloud don't align. Yep. If the software is robust enough, it will recover. But a lot of times the software isn't robust enough. That makes a lot so of sense. So now the robot is stuck, right? It doesn't know where it is it, because it lost localization. That's yep. what it means. It doesn't know how to get to where it needs to go. Yeah. It stops until somebody fixes it. Yeah. So that's a small failure. It's easy to recover. Does that usually just look like a manual reset at that point with legacy systems or is there... Again, I think some robots are smart enough and over time they get to the point where they're more and more resilient. Sure. So again, that has to do with the, like over the life cycle of a robot, when they start, you know, so you work in the really, really early days, the prototype phase. Yep. Um, there's usually somebody kind of tinkering with a robot all the time. Yeah, yeah. Then you get to, you know, most companies go through this journey. You get to a point where you know, you have some robots out in the field. So you're out of the lab into the field, but you still have, you know, more engineers than you have robots. Yeah, well, and you can still do that in a field setting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, it, with, uh, with AMRs, which uh, the common practice is to have a chaperone in the yeah. initial deployments, That's... right? And obviously that doesn't scale. Um, but when there's somebody around that's trained by car. you, pardon me? It's unless it's a car. Unless it's a car and then you <laughs> do it for longer. But eventually, yeah. the whole point of a driverless yep. car is that you don't need a there's no driver. driver. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so again, I think once you get to that point, you're gonna ha you should have fewer failures, but now you have more robots. So yeah. the product of those two is either remains constant, it can go it. up or down, but it's still a, a high number. Yeah, yeah. And it happens frequently. And it's easy to fix if you have the right, the right setup, the right tools, the right processes. Sometimes it's a human in the loop. Um, but if you can fix localization in seconds. Yeah. Maybe nobody noticed. That's pretty awesome. So the perceived autonomy by an end user, by somebody seeing the robot who's not an expert, is that the robot keeps working. Yeah, it stopped to think for a second and then went back to work. Yeah, or maybe, maybe you, you like you're not it. like watching the robot. Like yeah. most of the time, you know, the robot is doing its thing. It's yeah. moving, you know, material from one end of the warehouse to the other. You only notice the robot when it arrives or it's in your path or something. The rest of the time, that's kind of the whole point of a robot that's autonomous. It's, it's doing its own thing. Yep. So, um, so, so that's one aspect, which is can you recover quickly from a non-catastrophic failure? Yeah. And the other is, do you have the data to continuously improve the software so that these things happen less and less and less over time on oh, a per awesome. unit basis, right? So yeah. if at the beginning your robot got lost Get yourself three times nine. a day, yeah. right? You can't really have 300 robots in the world getting lost three times a day. Nobody will buy that many robots from you. Yeah. Now, if you can recover quickly, then great, but, you know, it's still a lot of manual intervention. So as you scale, you want data from the field to use to make your robot better.
Yeah. And getting data from the field is hard because robots are generating massive amounts of data. Yeah, and absolutely. you only care about a sliver of that data Completely when something agree. goes wrong. Yeah. So, um, so once you have all that data, now you can tweak the software, you can roll it out, you can see, is this version of the software better than this other version? You can compare the metrics. So again, this is what you do as your company scales into the hundreds or thousands of robots. Yeah. So it's a whole journey and to some extent, every new robot needs to go through through that process. You can't, it's hard to skip stages. So what are some of the things you've learned off data that you've captured from robots in the field um, you know, using an orbit? So I'm kind of curious. Well, I think I can confirm that robots aren't perfect, yeah, even the enough. best of robots. Um, obviously, you can spend more time in the lab to make your robot more robust. Yeah. No, but I mean, like anecdotally, like what are some specific things you've seen um, that, you know, the data has kind of shed light on that might not have been apparent just from looking at it or... So here's a really interesting case, again, with, with a mobile robot. Um, and I'm not going to name names, uh, but it was a, a robot that was deployed in hundreds of sites. And so it didn't have like somebody following the robot. And the sites were all different, right? Indoor so or outdoor? Just so it, was indoor. It. Okay. it was indoor. It was just indoor. So there was this one robot that would misbehave every day at 3 p.m. Oh, interesting. Like one particular or the one, one model particular across robot, multiple One particular robot, one unit. Got it. But then it, it, would, it would stop and not complete its mission. Huh. And then after a lot of uh, investigation, what they discovered was there was a a skylight and door would come in and there was a like a like a piece of metal um kind of com you know in the in the you know covering the crack between two um p two parts of the floor yeah right um so that would reflect and it would overwhelm the the sensors and the robot was always in that position at 3 p.m. So it and the, was the robot had a mission that started around 3 p.m. and always went through that space. Huh. But it did it, it did that three times during the day, and the other two times, it just didn't have this problem because of the position of the sun. Because yeah, there was nothing nothing reflecting at that time. That's so one of those kind of like those are really really hard to find. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think there. Are, other situations that are a little bit more uh, like easier to understand, but um, maybe more exciting even. Um, another robot, it was like a really tall robot. Um, and somebody had, and it worked in retail stores. So somebody at one store had, you know, it had hung uh, like an extension cord across <laughs> from one aisle to the next overhead. And then the robot like snagged, but the base kept going, right? Of course. So yeah, that was um, entertaining. Was it, was there anything physically damaged or you just get a good video out of it, I'm guessing? I think there may have been some nah. mechanical damage in that case. It's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, so I think the, the conclusion is you will have some of these catastrophic failures. I think we've all seen the videos of, you know, robots tumbling down the escalator yep. or yeah, falling was... into a water fountain or whatever. Yep. I know who you're talking about. Those, you know, stuff happens in the in, in the physical world. There's not a whole lot you can do at that point. Right. Yeah. Well, and those failures are, I mean, like you said, it, the, the more robots you've got deployed, I mean, we see it all the time in early stage robots just because yeah. you're still figuring out the system and, and yeah. it does fail. And that's kind of a motif of mine as I, I like to destigmatize those failures. Yeah. But then I'm also really happy about what you're doing because you're attempting to learn from them at scale. 
mm-hmm. and and prevent them more. So, yeah, in theory, it's awesome, <laughs> and yes. it sounds like in practice from the skylight example. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean, and they're more, um, I would say, more mundane cases, yeah. right? Where it's like the robot is trying to dock, and let's say ninety percent of the time, it or ninety five percent of the time, it docks just fine. So you're like, oh, that's pretty good, ninety five percent. But then you have a hundred robots, and they dock five times a day. Yeah. So all of a sudden, By the end of the day, a got, bunch of times yeah. each day, the robot runs out of battery because it couldn't dock. Now that's really bad, right? Now you need to call someone on site to go push the the robot maybe two inches in. And you've got that 25 times a day in your right. example, which is a pretty big pain in the that's, ass. That's a pain in the ass. Um and people will say, oh, your robot doesn't work. And, you know, I mean, it works pretty good. 95% of the time is pretty good. But can you then through maybe some, could be a, an automatic recovery or it could be a human in the loop, just dealing with those exceptions. It's a lot more efficient than trying to make your robot perfect when you have one robot, right? Because you're not going to have all the situations. Yeah. Um, and it's just like just how chaotic the, the 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 real world is. Yeah, my my brain on that one in particular goes to just monitoring state of charge. And I mean, this is a naive approach, and I'm sure there's better ways to solve this. But you know, if well, I guess I mean you would know if you had a docking failure. Like that seems like something identifiable. If you try to dock and then you aren't docked, I mean that's that should in theory trigger like an identifiable error state that you can sure. call out to, you know, the janitor or whatever and just have them pop it on. And that 25 a day. times a day, if you caught it early enough that you didn't jeopardize the robot's mission wouldn't be bad. But if the robot fails to dock and charge, I guess, and then it needs to be somewhere, I mean, I guess in theory you could send another robot, but you've got a bunch of down robots unless you've got somebody really diligent doing, you know, Receding. Yeah, but I mean, the whoever is around has a job to do. Yeah. And if you start, but, you know, if you start sending them a text multiple times a day, human nature dictates they're going to unplug the robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And and then now you, ha- you, you just escalated the problem. But I, I guess maybe this is just me thinking in the old school, but why not just... If you have one person that's, you know, the, I don't know, like robot, you know, reliability technician for that fleet of 100, I'm just making up a title, sure. and and their whole job is to just stick them back on the docks. I mean, that's not bad to have 100 robots operating and have to pay one person 15 bucks an hour. Like, that's a pretty... If they can do it remotely, right? Because if now your robots well, are... even if they're on site, I mean... Yeah, but what if they're in 100 locations? Oh, well, that then you're screwed. <laughs> and that happens, right? I mean, yeah. there's there's all sorts of situations where where you're distributed, right? You yeah, don't that have makes all a lot together. of sense. Yeah. I, I was thinking about a central location, right, 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 uh, right. Um, and I think you were touching on something else, which is, you know, I should be able to detect if you know the battery is be below a certain value. Yeah, totally detectable. Or if you had a docking failure. But the question is, how do you? propagate that and how do you take action and how do you raise visibility yeah and what happens is every robotics company that whose robot runs on battery ends up writing a lot of code just to find out if the robot ran out of battery or not and everyone goes through that same kind of like process yeah. because in the lab the robot started beeping you walked up to it and you plugged it in or you push it onto the dock. Yeah. But the minute it's out in the field and you're not there, then it gets more complicated. So it's like, oh, you know, we should have... I mean, the text that you mentioned, it seems like the obvious way to, to alert on it. But right. somebody has to write that software. And and it's usually the intern. Because, you know, like the real work is making the robot, not 
doing some like side notification to yeah. a text message application. It's like, you know, let's have the intern do it. And then the intern, you know, finishes their internship. They go back to college, they graduate, they go work somewhere else. Now you have this piece of code <laughs> that nobody knows how to maintain. Yep. And yep. it lives for years. And years later, you know, you change your battery, you know, you upgrade it to a new model, and then you need to change the, the amperage at which you alert. And yeah. all of a sudden... Probably voltage, but yeah. Or voltage, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore because your intern hard-coded into an old system. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that nobody knows how to maintain. So, and again, this web... I'm kind of making fun of it a little bit, but it happens a lot more than, uh, than oh, yeah, yeah. you would accept. Well, and, and I mean, I, I sort of see where you're going with this, right? Which is if somebody were to come along and make a universal solution that everybody could plug into their robot right. so they didn't have to have something, you know, reinventing the wheel every single time. Wouldn't that be nice? Correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, yeah, that that actually does seem quite useful, even even at the early stage. Um, another thing I want to mention is, um, so I, I think you asked me at the very beginning, how did I get into this? And I kind of, I guess I went on a tangent myself, so I should have my own sign for it. Um, so um, the interesting thing is uh, <laughs> my, so my co-founder, uh, had been working with robots for quite some time. He was part of the whole like Willow Garage uh, group oh, cool. and, and all of that. Worked with a lot of the post Willow companies and, and so on. And he ended up kind of building from scratch a lot of these systems, kind of like that that battery. Instead of the intern, it was my co-founder. Yeah, I mean, we've uh, had to build that system a bunch of times. Yes, and then after a while, he's like, you know, why why are we building this from scratch each time? And at the time, I knew absolutely nothing about robots, right? And we got to talking, and he told me how things were done. Good, thank you. Um, I kind of didn't believe his description of how this was done. Like this whole, like, the intern wrote it. And so I'm like, no, oh, that can't be right. I mean, these are like really smart people from places like CMU and MIT. I'm sure Stanford. they have uh, the best monitoring solutions. Let's go talk, let's go talk to a bunch of, you know, uh, robotic startup CTOs. We kind of confirmed that they all felt it was really important, but there were all these even more important things that always were above those. Yeah, and you only have so many resources and you're trying to make a robot work, which right. is a daunting task. Yeah, my litmus test was, okay, you just closed a round of funding. You can hire 20 more, twenty engineers tomorrow. How many of those engineers would you like to, have, to be working on the robot versus on some of this like infrastructure stuff? And the answer pre-, pre uh, predictably was what I would like all 20 to be working on the robot because <laughs> I have this like humongous backlog. But I kind of feel I should have somebody start to look into this because we're starting to scale. So that I felt that was the, the signal that there was, a, there was an opening uh, to build a platform that gives you maybe not 100% of what you need, but if we can give you 80%, and then the last 20% is, you know, your super special sauce, then we can help you go faster. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome, actually. Yeah, and I'd, I'd mentioned, um, well, actually, you showed me, um, you know, a pretty awesome demo a few weeks ago, which was really neat. And I don't know, I mean, I'm guessing the robot you showed me wasn't in an Orbit prod product. It was like a robot that you got from somewhere and then just put in Orbit onto and put into the in Orbit ecosystem. 
Yeah, so we don't make robots. Yeah, which is um, which is interesting. So, so to me. we uh, are uh, as much as we can robot agnostic. We support all kinds of robots. We've done integrations with dozens of model types. Yeah, or I should say, our customers use our platform to integrate the robot into an orbit. Yeah, um, do you guys provide integration support? We can hold your hand. But it's your robot, and you know it best. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we work with all kinds of robots, and I mean, we just spend whatever fifteen minutes talking about this very abstract idea of data and so on. Um, so we kind of had a hard time when we don't have twenty minutes to explain it. Basically, making this idea of an orbit really come to life for people. You know, what do you mean by RoboOps? So we decided we wanted to show you. Yeah. And so we uh, just very recently, a couple of months ago, opened up what we call the robot space. It's in Mountain View in California, uh, middle of Silicon Valley, maybe just to set the stage. It's a suburb, pedestrian street, uh, people walking around, restaurants all around, startups on the second floor of every building. Uh, Google is less than a mile away. Um, Apple, maybe a few miles from there. So, you know, very techy area. And what we did is we wanted to have a, a space where you can see the robots moving around. Um, and we have robots from different companies. They send us the robots. We add them to our kind of our staff of robots, if you will, and we put them to work. So these and are customer robots. These are customer or partner robots. Yeah. Cool. Um, and we have them doing real work. It's a little bit of pretend work, right? Because we're not running a warehouse, uh, any commerce fulfillment. Showcase, yeah. But we have them doing real things that they would do in the real world. Um, and then because it's our space, we can control a lot of things. So we've set up, for example, fixed cameras, and then we got those connected to an orbit uh, through our platform. So you can in real time monitor what the robots are doing. We always had the kind of first person view from the robot's camera, but now we added third person view. Um, if you're a gamer, you'll, you'll recognize that. Uh, sometimes you want uh, FPV and sometimes you don't. Yeah. So, uh, but then we said, well, we can interact with other things that are not robots. So we have a door that the robot can go through and we control the, the interaction between those. Um, so we're adding more and more robots and more interesting behavior. What's a little unique about what we do is, well, of course, we use this for customer demos. So when a customer comes in, we'll, we'll show instead of tell. Uh, we also tell afterwards. But uh, at, at least it starts with, with showing the, the technology at work. Uh, but what's the, the kind of unique or unconventional part is this is actually in a retail space. So we actually open to the public, to a general public, for a few hours each day. And our motivation there is to get the people who are not working in robotics, so maybe not so much your audience. Mountain View, <laughs> I would uh, say. Yeah, well, I mean, we do get a lot of geeks coming in who yeah. are like, oh, I work at NASA, which is also down the street. Yep. But, um, but they also, then they come back and they bring their five-year-old kid. Oh, that's awesome. Um, um, and then we've been doing all sorts of uh, community events. So we had a uh, women in robotics event. We had Silicon Valley Robotics. Is that Andra's group? Or yeah, Andra. Group? Yeah. Um, we've had uh, a group from CMU Silicon Valley. It's an uh, interesting little campus co-located with NASA there, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So they're, again, uh, a mile from our office. So uh, one of the professors brought a whole class uh, to learn about what we do. Uh, and we're doing a lot of these community engagements. We support the Mountain View High School Robotics, uh, uh, First Robotics Club. That's awesome. Um, and again, I think what we're trying to do is bring people in, show them, you know, what a real robot looks like. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, you know, we tried to have a little bit of fun. Yeah. So I, I was thinking when I said that would only work in my view, I wasn't trying to be disparaging. I was more just thinking as a sales technique because you've got all these, you know, people that are tech decision makers that might be walking by your retail space that could actually purchase an orbit for their companies. That like did cross many, our minds, but yeah. but it's not. But it sounds like you're using it for community outreach. Yeah, yeah. is what I'm hearing as well. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think either sure. way. I, I think those two things are not you know mutually ex exclusive, right? Yeah. Um, like what we'll do is when we have uh, you know a big corporate customer coming in, yeah, we'll be like, okay, sorry, it's closed. Uh, you know, that yeah, makes sense. Um, but uh, but it is actually interesting to force ourselves. Yeah to create an environment where it's easy to explain what we do to like a regular person off the street. Sure. Do you ever have inbound corporate sales just from regular people walking in that might not be aware of you before they see the demo, but maybe they work somewhere that could use your software? So let me give you an example. It's not exactly what you mentioned. Um, we have had people from NVIDIA and places like that come in. But uh, a more fun thing, example is, so when we, um, we were launching the robot space, we had like an event and we invited a few people and we had the robots moving around and bringing drinks to people. We had uh, a DJ and, oh, cool. you know, we have um, w one of our uh, team members who actually runs the robot space. He's a very talented chef. So he prepared this whole like sushi spread. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we had someone else uh, mixing drinks. Actually, that one was fun too. A uh, little side, side discussion. Uh, sure. He came up with this idea of having, you know, using uh, GPT-3 to feed it the list of drinks that we had, the, huh. li the list of booze, right? <laughs> and it would generate a recipe on the fly. That's awesome. So we had a tablet. So basically you walked up to the bar, hit a button, you got a unique drink, and the deal was you had to drink it. Does it integrate into, I'm guessing a human's mixing this based yes. off GPT. Yeah, so this, okay. this was kind of like- So you're not like mechatronically, show. but that's still pretty cool. Maybe, yeah. Version two will be, yeah. you know, with some robot arms doing the mixing. I mean, you could even just do it mechatronically with valves and timing. Yeah, and true, yes. true. Anyway, so we're we're doing this event, um, and there's a lot of people, right? And it was invite only, so we had some random people off the street trying to, you know, uh, gate crash, and uh, as they do. As they do, and uh, which, you know, to me, it was validation that we had an event that was hopping. Uh, so we were kind of taking turns, you know, turning people away. So at one point, I'm, um, you know, some person comes in and I'm like, you know, sorry, it's a private event. He's like, and he, he sees those robots moving around and he's yeah. like, so what is this? It's like, oh, you know, we do something with robots. And... The guy shows me his uh, his hat, and it was a CMU hat, and he's like, <laughs> I'm a roboticist at NASA. So to me, it's like even the gate crashers are roboticists. <laughs> that, that's that kind of what I was thinking might end up being the case. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, uh, but we I've do, spent time we do in that get, neighborhood. Like, There's like a lot of roboticists per capita yes. and engineers per capita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so, and, and again, I think it's... Um, especially coming out of you know the COVID uh, years. You mentioned Andra uh, at Silicon Valley Robotics. She does a great yeah. job building community. Well, and your party sounds similar to something she might do at Circuit Launch, to be honest. Like, Well, so we actually hosted Bots and Beers oh, cool. at our space. That's awesome. So it's a way to complement. So Circuit yeah, Launch is in one side of the, of the bay, we're at the other end. Yep. So we can cover more ground. And, and for us, it's just always fun to host uh, people uh, from the community. Yeah, I, I, those events are a blast. I always have a really good time. And I, I was going there for a while. I was I was in the Bay Area a lot in uh, 2019. And um, I started to notice like there was a pretty good nucleus of regulars that would show up at those things. And, and yeah. it was really fun. Andrew and Michael's son is, is really good on the barbecue too. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I, nice. Uh, yeah, and it's good when you have somebody that knows how to cook in the crew.
So uh, it sounds it sounds really fun. I would love to go to one of those events at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. I also I gotta say like when we were in the robot operations group meetup, which by the way, thank you, uh, mm. and thank you, Joe Wecheck also for starting that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been great. Just a really awesome source of networking and just kind of brainstorming interesting concepts and robot operations. And it's good for me as an early stage guy to start thinking about some of these things and. Hopefully my harebrained ideas are useful. I like apologize to Joe for talking too much. He's like, no, 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 it was great. Yeah. And so I, um, you know, anyway, when, when I saw you in the last one and the robot came in from behind you and was running its loop, you know, I'm just like, ah, that's really awesome. <laughs> like, and this is going to sound stupid to somebody that isn't like, you know, in the industry. But to me, like one of the things that was so impressive is that it was, you didn't, you weren't paying attention to the robot for one. So it was kind of like, you know, just something that presumably like you've, you've got it's to be running all the time. To. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing was that it wasn't broken. <laughs> like right. it was actually working, <laughs> which that, that sounds like, you know, a weird thing to say, but I mean, at the stage we're at in 2023 with robotics, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, broken robots out there. I mean, sure. You're you're saying like you know your charging algorithm works five percent of the time, or you're docking to the charging station. That's not a good percent. I mean, ninety five percent. I mean, you know, because that means five percent of the time it doesn't doesn't connect. And and the reality is, it usually starts at sixty two percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if that, you know, it's probably higher than that. Like in in something commercial, you'd hope. But nobody wants to talk about or show or admit to their failures. Right. And so as a result, I think, you know, the greater populace isn't doing as much to to solve those problems as they could be. And they are solvable. You know, it's just solvable. tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, what are some of the issues that I guess you've come across in trying to fit a solution, you know, to I mean, it's a lot of problems you're trying to it's it, this is kind of an abstract idea, but I do well with concrete examples. So okay. I appreciate you bringing up the charging example for one, you know, and some of the other ones we've talked about. But what are some of the issues you've you've kind of come across and trying to fit these across like any robot? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't always have USB, for instance. Like what right. are how are you are you overcoming those hurdles? So I think there, there's two sides to the answer. Sure. So one is uh, functionally, what do you need? You know, and it's going to depend on where you are in your journey of, you know, scaling, right? If you're really early, a lot of what you need is just data, right? So observability is the, the, the technical term, right? So I want to know what's happening with my robot, which is was easy when it was, you know, within arm's reach, but harder when it's deployed at a customer site. So just that data is useful. Um, and it never goes away. You always get more and more data because now you multiply times hundreds of robots. Obviously, you're <laughs> gonna you're gonna get a lot of data. I'm sure Azure or AWS loves you. Yeah, and, and and part of the trick is you know you don't collect all the data. You collect the right data, right? Um, so, but that's that's one aspect. And of course, you need to turn data into something actionable, right? Into insights. Then. You're like, okay, great. We now have visibility into what's going on. The next need on, again, staying on the functional side is, um, you know, what we call operations. So the robot didn't dock. Okay, what do I do? So we have um, on our platform, we have tools to basically nudge the robot back to what it should be doing. And um, it's a very different approach from, let's say, well, I'm going to teleoperate the robot so I don't need autonomy. Right? Yeah. This is this is not what we're going after. It's like the robot is autonomous. It's just not perfectly autonomous. Yeah. So we can we can have Realistic. someone jump in yeah. and and help. Um, um, and somebody who also talks about you know human in the loop quite a bit is uh, Eric Neves from Plus One Robotics. Right. Yeah. So their whole company is set up around that concept. Right. So what we do is we build a platform so that anyone. Can, can do that kind of like human in the loop approach. Then you get into even higher level things, right? So now you're talking about orchestration. And orchestration for me is 
the robot and its environment. So again, I mentioned being able to control doors so the robot can go through a door. Um, you might find that in, uh, like in a plant where they have multiple, they have a warehouse over here, they have a production line over, over there. Yeah. And a robot needs to move material from one to the other. There's a door. There are ways to do that, you know, old fashioned ways with sensors and so on. We do that through software. That's awesome. And then doing it through software allows you to do, you know, much more interesting things. You can be predictive, you can prioritize which robot goes through first. So you can start to do a lot, a lot more things. Does orchestration uh, involve multiple robots as well as it can uh, also third party, I guess, objects like doors and so to me, and, it's like elevators. objects, software. So in a, in a warehouse environment, everyone talks about the warehouse management system, the WMS, which is kind of the source of truth for where everything is in the warehouse. Well, that needs to dispatch a robot and you need to have the software and the robot behavior be coordinated. Uh, and then I think we do start to see multiple robots having to orchestrate their behavior. Not as common as all the other cases, but it happens. So yeah. in our space, we had two robots and one is doing restocking and the other one is doing, you know, picking. So when an yeah. order comes in, um, you can have the robot go to a shelf and you can have still a worker um, like a warehouse worker, an associate, put an item on the robot. And now let's say the robot needs to go to the back through that door. Yeah. But then you have the, um, the restocking robot trying yeah. to go through the door at the same time. So we can be the traffic cop That's and make cool. sure that they don't get in each other's ways. You don't get kind of into a traffic jam or a collision or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so when you say retail space, I'd initially thought you meant like a retail display of multiple robots working together. Like the product was the, you know, in orbit, but it sounds like you're, do you have a mock, like, are you actually selling some like consumer good using robots? And that's the example. We are, we actually sell merch. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, so we that's have, that's interesting. So yeah. I didn't realize that's what you meant, which, okay. Yes. It's, it's making more sense now. I apologize. Yeah. No, no, all good, comments. all yeah, good. Yeah. It's not an obvious concept. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah so we have uh, one of our um, ways of like kind of making what we do a little bit more relatable and robots more relatable to children, for example. Yeah. Or ch children at heart is we have a mascot. Um, it's called Orbito. And uh, it's uh, like a little robot. So we have 3D printed versions of our mascot. And like we are a terrible retailer because we end up giving away a lot of things. <laughs> but, uh, but we have t-shirts, we have hoodies. Uh, we're now having some, um, again, on the, you know, teaching about robotics, we have these uh, line following uh, toys. Oh, cool. Right? Uh, in the shape of our mascot. Um, Wait, that's custom? Okay, that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're doing a lot Surely of you know, fun things. Surely an intern made that. <laughs> um, we actually partnered with a, uh, a company that does kind of custom 3D printing and... and so you used a, cool. an existing product and you put Orbito over the top of it. We bought the, the base yeah. uh, as a component because that's kind of... It's not super techy, but... That makes sense. It, like but it's it's kind of, it's not a bad too. approximation yeah. of what an uh, uh, automatic guided vehicle, an HGV, does, right? Yeah. It follows a magnetic stripe on the floor. These guys follow a line that you draw with a black marker. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we do have some of these things that we sell. Um, obviously, we're not out to make a lot of money with our merch. Uh, it's just a, a way to make it more more relatable. And, and we have worked with robotics companies with hundreds of robots in real retail stores. Yeah. So we're applying some of that. Now, we couldn't go and mess with a retail store when it was somebody else's. Yeah. Um, um, you know, company that has 5,000 retail stores, they probably don't want us playing with their configuration. 
But in our space, we can try things that are a little bit more advanced. For example, we have a pick to light system that we built. Um, pick to light? So in warehouses, it's all about speed, right? It's all, you know, so an order comes in and you need to pick up, you know, a glass, right? You're, yeah. you're buying, somebody who's buying a glass, there's a shelf with glasses, but there's lots of shelves with lots of different types of glasses, right? So how do you know which one goes in this order? So in, in some of the warehouses, the, sh the side of the shelf has a light that turns on to indicate to the worker which item to pick. Oh, got so it. So it's pick to light means yeah. go to the light and pick that item. Yeah. So we built our own, right? Nice. Just because we can. Um, and then we, now that's integrated with an orbit. So now we're, we're building like the whole ecosystem. Now the idea is in a real deployment, you're going to use a commercial pick to light system. Yeah. Um, but at least we're illustrating a lot of these concepts. So, so yeah, I think I, we're, we're trying to bring a lot of these things that maybe, so I'll, I'll tell you something. So when I was getting into this, uh, I got a chance, um, this was years ago before the pandemic and everything, got a chance to tour uh, an Amazon fulfillment center. Oh, cool. Really, really cool. It's like something like a million square feet under one roof. That's wild. And... Actually, I've been in facilities that size in the automotive space. Yes. <laughs> so there's a ton of people, yeah. but also hundreds of robots moving around. Um, yep. But the regular person doesn't get a chance to, to, to see that, right? So we wanted to make that a little bit more accessible, easier to understand. Um, and obviously, we're not running a mission critical operation like Amazon does with uh, with fulfillment, but it helps people understand what happens when they when they press that buy button yeah. on on their screen. Um, I think it's interesting to to ex you know expose people to that. That's awesome. So people can see their order for merch getting fulfilled in front of them. That's probably part of the fun of buying the merch for certain folks. Right. I would think, especially in the Bay Area, like you've got early adopters that want to see cool tech and are willing to kind of, you know, they just want it to see something awesome. And so like, yeah. they'll probably buy it just to watch it get fulfilled in some cases, I would imagine. Yeah. And I have to tell you, like one of my favorite things is when like they bring a child, like we had like a five-year-old came in and the, the parent said, my child is obsessed with robots, right? So I had to bring them in. Nice. And again, I mentioned we're a terrible retailer, so we gave <laughs> one of our uh, 3D printed things away. But we had the robot deliver it to the child. So we have That's a cool. place where they could sit down. The robot is kind of child size, so it's not intimidating. And then how they their face lights up. And then it's like, oh, this is yours. And like they look at their parent, you know, can I grab it? It's like, yeah. And, and, and that now they have like a physical thing that they can take with them. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, 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 that's awesome. pretty rewarding. That's really cool. When I, when I used to do battle bots back, back when I was a student, uh, one of the things that somebody else showed me that was kind of fun to do in the pit area was to give broken bits off your robot that just got destroyed to a small kid that would, so like there'd be a lot of kids cause you know, a lot of the builders were parents right. and then civilians would come in just to watch the fights. And so it was, it was kind of this indie scene. Like you, they do them in like science centers and like there was one in the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia and you know, a bunch of people would bring their thing that they built, you destroy it and then bits would fall off. And so, you know, you tell the kid, Hey, you want a piece of a robot? You know, like, Oh, it's, I get to keep this. Yeah. You know, to you right. it's garbage, but to them, yes. you know, it's something that they can treasure and you know, it's, it's awesome. They got a piece of a robot. Yeah. So. So for the record, we don't condone violence against robots. <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, we have like, you know, $40,000 robots, so we don't want to destroy them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it, our mission with this is to demystify robotics. And once yeah. you see, like, it's a platform that moves around, it's like, oh, okay, all right, now, now I understand. Because I think most people, 
you know, maybe not your audience, which is very sophisticated about robotics, but the regular person, if you say, draw me a robot, right? And it's probably something from, you know, Star, Star Wars, Wars or yep. something like that. And it's like, eh, you know, real robots are a little different. Um, uh, or maybe they've seen, you know, pictures of an automotive uh, factory. Which those are inspiring as well. Like they're beautiful they are. in a different way. But now there, there are so many different form factors. Like, for example, we work, one of our customers is one of the largest manufacturers of cleaning equipment, industrial cleaning equipment. Uh, a company out of Germany called Karscher or Kerhel. Um, so they make everything from pressure washers that you might use to clean your backyard to street sweepers. Cool. Um, they make something called a floor scrubber. And traditionally, this is a machine kind of like a, like a small tractor that you sit on. And it's kind of like a Zamboni mine without the ice, right? You have to yeah. go back and forth and cover every square foot uh, in the area. And maybe you're, you're cleaning a, an airport terminal. Yep. Right. And those things are big. You have to do that every night and it takes, you know, four hours to cover one terminal, let's say. Um, so instead of having someone like kind of mindlessly going back and forth, now it's autonomous. That's really cool. So you worked with Karsher on automating that? So they, again, they're the experts yeah. in their robot and their navigation and all of that. Yeah. And I think they built something really unique. For example, with cleaning, you want almost the opposite of what you want with material handling. You want yeah. the robot to go really close to the wall, yeah. right? So you don't miss, miss that edge. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so they did all of that, uh, but we helped them uh, monitor. We helped them jump in when there's a problem. That's cool. Um, and, you know, a lot of things we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, through the combination of their software and our software and, you know, people helping, now you can get to, you know, high nines of performance. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that that's really great. So this looks very different from what you might imagine as a robot because it's a cleaning machine. It's like, a, it doesn't look like a Roomba, but conceptually you can think of it as a giant Roomba. So when we worked on the... Uh first user interface for Discovery Robotics commercial mm. cleaning robot, we would sort yeah. of uh, playfully refer to it in the SKA office as the Roomboni. Yes, <laughs> so perfect. I can totally identify with the Roomba Zamboni analogy. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you one other cool thing about this particular yeah. robot. I'm geeking out, but yeah, it's all good. So, um, so a lot of robots have a docking station where they can recharge the battery, right? This one can also empty its gray water tank, oh, cool. refill the clean tank. That's awesome. So basically, it's fully autonomous. What's important here is, you know, there's a trade-off. Like if you have a huge water tank, then you can cover more space. But now the machine is big and it can't get into tight spaces. And the price goes up. And, and the price goes up. The and, weight goes you know, up. It can't go. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more water sloshing around. All, all of the problems. Yeah. But so you wouldn't be able to, to clean like a tight uh, aisle, for example, in a, in a retail store, for example. Um, now, if you make the machine smaller, then it can only cover so much ground. And now you need someone to stop what they're doing and go refill the machine. So they basically broke that, that trade off by saying, what if we can do both, right? So. There's, it, the machine is small enough to get into some of these tight spaces. And when it's done, it goes back, recharges its battery, empties the tank, refills, and then goes and covers uh, the next area. That's sweet. That's an awesome feature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I think, ironically, the, the latest Roomba, the really expensive one, can empty its its deposit. Yeah, I noticed that maybe like a couple of years ago or a year ago they introduced that feature. I was really impressed with that as well. Mm, yeah. 
it's loud as hell. I don't know if you've. I mean, it, I it, haven't. I haven't actually used. Yeah, one. it makes yeah. it makes a ton of noise. I think Shark Ninjas already made a knockoff, or maybe they were first. I have no idea. Um, but there's a bunch of different competing products that can do that now and empty the hopper. But that, I feel like that's a great feature for the same. Like, I mean, you know, I've still got like an older, um, you know, Roomba clone from yep. a while ago. And I mean, I have to empty it like, you know, yeah. four times before it finishes. Yeah. <laughs> its job. So. so on that topic, um, maybe we can uh, pour one out for Nito Robotics that, that just, um, um, you know, went out of business, uh, unfortunately. That is unfortunate. Yeah. I, I feel kind of dumb. I, I didn't hear about that yet. What happened? They just... Uh... It's I mean, they had a tough cool, times. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think they were first in a lot of things, right? The I first think lighter on the one first of those lighter, little, yes. little guys, uh, as far as I know. So I think they they did have technology ahead of many others. I think we all know that's necessary, but they the first necessary, ones to but not sufficient. slam. I mean, I w you'd think because of the lighter, they might have been, um, or at least I. I sure. Yeah, that's yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then um, iRobot instituted like a camera-based slam, I guess, to compete with that probably. Huh. Right. But in the early Roombas, they didn't have slam, right? Yeah, they yeah, had yeah. this coverage algorithm. Like I said, I have a really old one. Mine still meanders. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah. You know, the dead reckoning way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, I, on the business side, robotics is 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 tough, right? Yeah, you for know, sure. You can have... On the technical side, it's tough. Great technology. Yeah. yeah. The hardware is tough. I mean, the software, yeah. you know, better than me is tough. Yeah. I mean, it's it's these are challenging problems. I mean, and even then, you can engineer something awesome. That's you know, and it's a few things, right? It's what you said, which is you might just not have a product market fit, uh, or you know, you might have a product market fit, but you miss size the market, and you know, so you, now you're feeding. or you can't scale, yeah, right, or you can't scale, or you know, like I feel like a lot of times, like a first mover introduces something that might be ahead of its time. Like, I think we saw that with Rethink Robotics with the Baxter where, you know, it was, I mean, it's the first cobot that I know of, but, at the, you know, and now they're ubiquitous. But at the same time, you know, they use series elastic actuators. It was slow as hell. It probably didn't need the second arm on it. It, you know, didn't need that screen that it had. So these are all expensive features. Um, I mean, we used one for my grad school project and mm -hmm. then we ended up switching to an ABB arm. But for a little bit, we used one. And um, I mean, it would go like, you know, maybe six, three inches from like its target point at the end of the, the arm. And so, you know, it was, I think that was to do with like how the series elastic actuation was tuned. But I think very low uh, repeatability yeah, accuracy. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. what they were going, but I guess they were trying to compensate by having like cameras on the end of arm tooling to servo, but I don't know. It just wasn't fully fleshed out because they were the first ones, you know, to to go on that beach. But and, I think it inspired yeah. a lot of the Absolutely. evolution. Yeah, so, yeah. so as a, if you take a more uh, kind of like evolutionary uh, approach, right? Oh, they paved um, the way for Universal and yeah. a lot of Fanex new products. I mean, like you know, and, and I mean, you know, it's it's adopted when Fanex starts making it. <laughs> like right. <laughs> so um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think um, on the uh, mobile robot side, uh, you know, we've now seen companies like uh, like Locus have over ten thousand robots. Um, Geek Plus, um, there's the little SoftBank Robotics, the the Wiz. They've also yeah. sold you know over ten thousand of those. Oh, so, that's wild. So there are um, sold or. RAS or you know whatever the model is, uh, so now you you do have companies that had have hit that scale. Of course, Amazon has over six hundred thousand robots. So I did not know that yes. these are their warehouse robots. Yeah, doesn't count the Astro. Probably not. But, <laughs> um, it's a rounding error at this point. Yeah, that's um, fair. yeah. but um, yeah. So I mean, obviously they acquired Kiva. Um, 10 years ago. Yeah, around there, I think. Yeah. Um, and now they're rolling out new types of robots. Um, you know, so I, I think obviously they're they're ahead of almost everyone. 
in terms of the scale of deployment. Uh, but really, I think, you know, maybe that's, uh, I have a question for you if that's allowed in the podcast. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you work at um, kind of at the very early stage, right? You can, somebody has an idea and you make it real. Um, yeah. Although, well, I don't want to derail your question. Well, so I'm interested in, you know, how do we get more of those to reach scale, right? Because making a robot that does X is fun and it's hard, but making a thousand robots of the <laughs> same kind doing X at scale. Oh, for sure, it's harder. I mean, yeah. it's the 80-20 rule, right? right? You know, you get it running the first time with 20% of the work and then, you know, just for people listening, you know, obviously what that is, but the last 80%, you probably know too, but is, uh, you know, 20% of the perceived result. And so... And I actually think the last 20% is 180% of the effort. Right? I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of like you miscalculated how much effort oh, it would I be see. and yeah, yeah. you have to recalibrate all the time and it's like, you thought it would be this much and it's actually, you know, a lot more, but yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, so what was the question again? So I think it was more like you're, you're in the really early stages. Are you actually at that point thinking about what would this look like if there were thousands of them in the world? In some cases, yes. Um, so when when we first started out, we were we were helping a lot of people just bring their ideas to prototype uh, and, and companies. And we worked with a lot of early stage startups and that was sort of a big element to it. Um, these days, we try to think about, you know, you kind of grow. And so you try to think about like, what are features that would be useful this thing to have at scale? So a lot of that comes down to systems architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I always prefer to work on projects that have the luxury of systems mm. architecture. Right. Uh, because, you know, you end up with a better product at the end. So we were working on a multi-robot uh, construction systems architecture um, for a product that's not out yet. So I can't say a whole lot about it. Uh, but one of the things that SKA's teams push for really hard was having onboard prognostics on mm -hmm. the hardware, um, you know, to be able to avoid unscheduled downtime and these things at deployment. So, yeah, I mean, that's something we think about, um, or at least we try to. I mean, it, sometimes, so something came across my desk yesterday where um, I was talking to somebody and, and they asked for a thing and they wanted... 10 of something, I'm gonna be intentionally vague here, uh, but they wanted 10 of, of, of a thing. And they wanted those 10 things from six months from clean sheet. And I'm like, well, you can't really design it properly in that amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if it was like a vase, yeah, you could, but like, this is a little more complicated than that. And so, you know, I, I made sure to stress when I was talking to this um, this party that, you know, yes, we can do that. However, you know, it's going to be a different product than what you're going to build at right. 100 or the 1,000 or the 10,000 unit quantity. Because in order to hit that timeline, we're going to have to make some significant compromises. And, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe mm -hmm. you just need something that works in the hands of your early adopters in order to, you know, get broader interest. And then you go back to the ground floor and re-engineer it. But ideally, you know, maybe we could extend that out to, you know, a year and a half, a year and, you know, really think about it and take our time and, and design something that is going to be, you know, you know, scalable. But I mean, not everyone's budgeted for that right out of the right. gate. Right. And so it just it sort of depends, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, in the in the software world, we have this notion of an MVP, right? A minimum viable product, which is you kind of assume you're going to have to either throw it away or rewrite most of it. So maybe that's the, the hardware version of that is you create one and 
there's going to be a generation two that you're going to design from scratch. Yeah. Based on what you learn with Gen One, we see you know and companies. It also makes your unit economics better. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, we've seen, for example, later stage things like serviceability become really critical, right? So being able to swap out a component without having to completely disassemble because you created, <laughs> you know, you know, your power board was above the, the battery or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, or your battery pack is like underneath and, right, exactly. and inside the robot where you got to reach in to, to yeah. swap it out. Yeah, so and, and maybe you... It's uh, maybe a premature optimization to try and do a hundred percent of that upfront, uh, but I think we we what we see is kind of like I almost call it fake product market fit, right? So yeah, it kind of works if you throw engineers at it. Um, the customer is sort of satisfied. But you still don't know what that looks like, you know, when you're in the hundreds or, or thousands. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's kind of like my passion is how can we get robots everywhere, right? Yeah. Why why don't we have already a lot more robots out in the world, uh, you know, helping out? Uh, clearly, we're in this. Um, I think I think we're still in the lowest unemployment rate in the US in 50 years, right? So when people talk about the labor shortage, that, that's one way in which it manifests. And um, yeah, if we could, you know, if we had more robots, I think we could be more sustainable. There's a lot of benefits to them. I know there's a lot of fears around yeah. them as well, but what? certainly I, I think maybe you as, as, as well as I believe that the, the benefits certainly outweigh the, the concerns. Yeah. And I mean, obviously we're biased because we're both roboticists and, you know, we get exposed to a lot of proverbial Kool-Aid as it were. But I mean, my opinion is that, you know, if you figure out ways to automate, you know, jobs that kind of suck anyway, I mean, you know, it's not like the people that were doing those jobs are just going to do like you just come up with something else for them to do. And then if we as a society are able to scale our productive throughput, you know, I mean, right. if we can make more things or have cleaner streets, you know, why wouldn't we just move on to the next problem and, and try to better ourselves in some other way with that newfound bandwidth? You know, I don't think we're all just going to sit on our asses like it's Wally -E and, you know, drink milkshakes all day. Like, I, I like to think, like, you know, maybe let's focus on the next obstacle yeah. and, and try to solve something else now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it sounds like you've thought about it and probably had this conversation a bunch of times as as I have. Uh, you know, I, I usually think of robots as kind of like the evolution of tools, right? So, yeah, we could still be digging with our, our hands and our fingernails would be like really strong. <laughs> and a downside of not doing that is my fingernails are kind of weak, right? Yeah, okay, but the shovel made us go faster, and now we could dig deeper holes than you ever could with just your hands. And then if you advance a few thousand years from the invention to the shovel to the, you know, the bulldozer, for example. Yeah, tunnel boring machines. Right. And now you can build things that otherwise it would have, like a lot of people would have died. And, and I think they did, uh, you know, uh, digging tunnels uh, with explosives. Yeah. Now you can you can have a machine that does it. Well, they uh, still do, but in way less numbers. I mean. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And, and now you can build bigger things, right, that you couldn't before. So I think it's hard for us as humans to imagine what else can we unlock right if we if we make this more accessible so maybe there's going to be you know the cost of construction will be lowered by a tenth and now everyone can have housing right yeah um so so i think it's it's interesting to me to think ahead what are some of the things that would change if we you know if we didn't have to um, if if we had different economics of, of yeah. building or cleaning you know, or whatever it might be. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree. And um, I mean, I always think about it on like a, a micro scale, like, you know, what would I do if I could free up, you know, four more hours out of my day, you know, and, right. and I feel like that applies to, to a macro scale yeah. too. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, building better, bigger things. I mean, you know, tallest buildings we've ever had. I mean, we're right. further along on space travel than we've ever been. Although I guess you could say maybe the Apollo was like a golden age, yes, but I don't think the sure. golden age, I think we're going to have another one. I, I hate to sound like a futurist now because I always say I can't predict the future of a crystal ball, but you know, I, I feel you've disarmed me, Florian. Because <laughs> you know, I've lowered your defenses. Well, yeah, and I think part of that is just the fact that you know you're pragmatic and you understand the technology, and you're not just you know pontificating and making the stuff up. I mean, you're somebody that is exposed to it in the real world, and I mean, you're, I don't want to say predictions, but maybe a little bit predictions. They're based on real observations of, you know, what you've seen and, you know, actual trends rather than just making something up. So for Although me, I, you know, we're all making stuff up. I, I can, I can make stuff up like the next <laughs> person, but, but yeah, I think it's, it's, I, uh, I would say maybe that, educated though. guess is yeah. the way I think about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe I, I just want to bring up another topic, which is, you know, here in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is reinventing itself, right? So, like today, I got to tour uh, Mill Nineteen. Oh, intro. Um, what do you think? What are they doing I, these days? So, but first, I mean, the Arm Institute is fantastic. Yeah, but, we remember. Um, we, but my initial Thanks, reaction, <laughs> my initial reaction was to the building, right, and the history of it. Um, so this was a steel mill from the 1800s. Uh, I think if I got it right, it was the largest at one point in the country. I don't know that part of the history, but I believe you. And then the company, you know, the, the 90s were not gentle and the company went out of business and they just kind of walked away. And you had this like humongous steel uh, building slowly corroding into <laughs> into uh, into the ground. Um, and then there was this effort to kind of like recover the site, right? Um, and what I really loved about it is they created a new building, but they left the original outside structure, which is all this like really rusted rusted through in some places. Yeah, it's like a building steel. inside of another building. Yes, that's and kind of holding the outside. I, I, I thought it they just were looks like so detached, cool. but I haven't been there in maybe three years or so. So I, I, the last time I was in Mill 19 was before the pandemic. Yeah. And I think the demos have changed in there too. Like I, I think they were running sure. different robots on the floor. I don't know what they're running now, but that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a yeah. neat concept. I kind of forgot how... Yeah, so symbolic of an undertaking that was right. That, that's that's yeah. kind of what I mean is, you know, there's like you're literally building next generation robots inside the husk of, you know, what used to be the the industry that that, you know, drove the, you know, the economics in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. And I think that's kind of the power of innovation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, it's 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 a neat piece. Um, the cynic in me couldn't help but notice that they position those doors. They're, they've got garage doors in that one bay there that open up into columns from the old building. Oh. <laughs> so you can't load in material. A bit of an engineering oversight. But we all make them from time to time. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of what that organization stands for. I mean, and I guess... You know, I, I saw that a while ago, so, you know, I got the wow, but you're right. It's it's a sweet piece of symbolism. And, I mean, Pittsburgh is, you know, a robotic city now. Like, yeah. I mean, that's among other things, but, I mean, that's that's what I see because I'm a roboticist. Yeah. So I've yeah, got yeah. the blinders on. And, I mean, we've got a ton of cool robots. I, I think, I mean, you guys have a ton of cool stuff. Boston has a ton of cool stuff. Um I've not spent as much time in like Scandinavia or Japan, yeah, Odense, but it Odense seems like it's really cool. Yeah. I got to visit last year. That's awesome. What was that like? It's 
really interesting because it's it's kind of a small town. Um, I think it's like maybe an hour and a half by train from Copenhagen. And it's like really ancient history, right? They have these houses going back to the 1700s, 1600s, I don't know, um, that are still standing. And then you have this like crazy concentration of robotic talent. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I think it's, I, I thought it was a, a, a great combination. Um, like lots of like really talented people that maybe are not as known here. Is there like a university there or what, what's that amalgamating around? Um, I think there's a university, but also the, the town kind of like decided, Yeah, you know, like, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, there was a seed to it, like something was already going on. And then they created this uh, kind of like a organization that attracts startups and gives them a, a space to start. Yeah. And then that brought more startups and more funding and. So they basically bootstrapped a, a, a little bit of a an town. ecosystem. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I think that that's that's fantastic. And again, I think we're seeing these kind of like clusters uh, emerge in in a few parts of the world. Uh, you know, Shenzhen is uh, also very big on, on not robotics. Not been yet, but it seems awesome. Like I've heard really great things, and the scale of some of those manufacturing operations. Right. From what I heard, like, it's just, you know, like, you can't unsee that. And I haven't seen it yet. And I really would like to. So I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pontificate and cut you off. There. No, no, no. That's yeah. I, I mean, I, I I get excited when I see this um, all this activity yeah. in, in the space. I mean, that's how I felt when I, I visited like automotive manufacturing facilities um, and when I've been in logistics facilities and probably how you felt when you were in that Amazon facility. Right. You're like, this is. You know, this is incredible, like what these guys have accomplished and, you know, the scale of this and, and the level of sophistication and the lessons learned on previous lessons because they've been doing this a while. And, and this isn't the first iteration of the the equipment in here or I don't know. I mean, I assume, you know, there's there's so much going on and it's it's just kind of inspiring. And it's its own world in a, in a place like that. Yeah. Just to go totally tangential, sorry. No, no, totally cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm I'm excited to see what what Pittsburgh will become over the next ten years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I like what it is now, um, because not a whole lot of people know about it. So it's relatively <laughs> inexpensive to live here at the moment. Uh, it won't be for very long. Right. But it and there we go making predictions again. <laughs> but uh it's, uh, you know, we've got great talent. I mean, you know, I think, you know, Carnegie Uni Mellon University for us probably was a lot of the seed for that. Um, but I don't think it's it's the only thing going on here anymore. Right. So I, I think it, it it definitely, well, I mean, I, with MIT, I think Boston had a lot, or sorry, with Boston, I think MIT had a lot to do with it in Cambridge. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think it's it's definitely related. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not like the only thing that city has going on anymore mm -hmm. and, and there's definitely growth happening mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Do you think Pittsburgh, like, I mean, since we're speculating, do you think like there'll be some specialization within robotics that ends up being popular here? Or do you think it's just, I mean, we, we tend to do a lot of earlier stage robotics companies right now seems to be our thing. So we're just kind of blasting out robotic startups um, right. pretty pretty rapidly at the moment. But we have less mature ones, I think. Um, I don't know, do you, do you see that changing? I don't see why, um, I don't see why you couldn't have like high scale production of robots, why any of these companies that are emerging now couldn't become the next, you know, the next big thing. Yeah. Um, I think what what I expect and, you know, other people will. I think there's two schools of thought and I'm more in one and maybe I'll be proven wrong. There's the let's build a humanoid robot that can do all the same things that humans can do. 
and there's many companies working on that. Um, I'm more on the camp of let's build machine that's optimized for a specific task. Yeah. And that does that really well. And my kind of like my mental model there is so um, imagine you have one of these humanoid robots. They're incredibly complex. They're expensive. They spend energy just standing, standing still. There. Yeah. Talked um, about this on another podcast. So let's say it's a you know three hundred thousand dollar unit, right? And I know there's a person that a lot of people know that says it's going to cost twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> um, let's say it's two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> um, could be any one of them. Could be. Um, $200,000, um, and let's say you need it to, you know, you know, we talked about cleaning an airport terminal. You need to clean an airport terminal, and then you give it a mop and a bucket, and you're like, go clean. It, you know, with a lot of uh, PhDs behind it, it will do it. But if you compare it to a machine that was built for that, that has a, you know, 100 liter uh, tank of water, doesn't need to go back and forth with the bucket each time, doesn't need to wring things, you know, wring the, the mop out each time. Like you can build something that's 100 times more efficient. Yeah. So I think there's this obsession uh, with humanoids. I think it's a little bit of a God complex as well. Yeah. But I envision, you know, thousands of companies each one focused on building a robot for X and getting really, really good at it, right? And I think we're seeing some of that with agriculture, for example, where, you know, a company that does strawberry picking is totally different from something that's doing apple picking um, because the needs are different, um, mechanics are different. Yeah. Um, and. I think as humans, we're limited by, you know, what we're born with. But with robots, you're not, right? You can build all the parts and you can have 10 arms or zero arms. Uh, and and yeah. it kind of, it just depends on what you're trying to do. So I, 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 my expectation is we'll see this like, um, and we're kind of seeing this already. I call it the, the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian of, explosion? Of robotics. So that was the the era when a lot of the the big um, mammals and animals, maybe not even mammals, maybe it was reptiles. Anyway, all the big like the dinosaurs and all of that. And there was this like over a short, you know, in geological terms, period of time, you know, hundreds of years, you saw like this explosion in the in the in the types of the variety of, of species on, on Earth. Evolutionary um, branch. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think we're kind of in the beginning of that Cambrian explosion for robotics. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike. Yeah. So we got pretty far off track from yeah. from where we started. Um, Sorry to, to no, it's fun. I I can I can do this for hours. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to keep going or should we should we taper back so people actually listen to this thing on their commute? <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I always worry about it because, I mean, I think you and I can probably shoot the breeze for another couple of hours, yeah. but people will get sick of us at some point. Sure. Well, why don't, why don't we call it then? Uh, I think that's that's a good note to end on is uh, we'll try not to bore you too much more here. Um, is there anything you want to plug on the way out on the episode? Um, so depending on when this airs, we'll be at Automate uh, pretty soon. So uh, we'll Probably have in like to... five weeks, if I'm being honest. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so we will have already done Automate <laughs> and hopefully we will have met some of you. Um, but also, uh, you know, if you're curious about seeing robots uh, delivering toy robots to children, uh, or just want to see cool orchestration at work. Uh, we have this space in Mountain View, California. You can learn more about it at inorbit.ai slash robot space. Awesome. Florian, thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Good to be here. Good to have you. Thanks for joining us today. 
If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.